This is lecture 12 for biology 178 covering ECG or electrocardiogram, hemodynamics, and the cardiac cycle. We're actually going to begin lecture 12 with a bit of a review. So if you remember, this is going to be the electrical conduction system of the heart. It starts, of course, with the pacemaker, the sinoatrial or SA node. It generates an action potential that propagates through the myocardial cells. The sinoatrial node sets the pace of the heart at about 70 beats per minute. The atrioventricular node is going to route the direction of electrical signals from the SA node and down the heart to the apex so that electrical signals travel from the apex towards the base. There's also going to be a delay in this system that is accomplished by a slower conductional signal through the nodal cells. This, of course, is going to allow the ventricles to fill with blood. Now we're going to go through all of the different events of the heart. Going through the conduction system events of the heart, we can see that it starts, of course, with the SA node depolarizing. From the SA node depolarizing, electrical activity will move rapidly towards the AV node through the internodal pathways. It will thereby hit the AV node and depolarization will spread across the atria, allowing them to then contract following that electrical buildup, the electrical signal of depolarizing. And then there will be a conduction down the bundle of Hiss or the AV bundle. Remember that as that electrical potential travels down that AV bundle, there is a slight delay. This is what allows the atria to contract and fill the ventricles with blood. From there, depolarization will then move rapidly through the ventricular conducting system, through the bundle branches, and then into the Purkinje fibers. This will cause the depolarization wave to spread from the point of the heart, which is the apex, and up towards the base, which is the wide part of the heart. And this is what is going to allow the heart to actually contract from apex to base and squeeze blood upwards and out the vessels. All of these events of the heart are measured electrically in a diagram called the electrocardiogram. Here we can see the electrocardiogram or ECG, sometimes referred to as EKG in slang, same thing. What the ECG represents is the summed electrical activity of all cells of the heart from the body surface. So this is actually looking at the total electrical activity of the heart in its entirety. It's not looking at just the pacemaker. It's not looking at just the myocardial cell. It's looking at the whole heart. Each one of these waves actually is going to represent different events in the heart electrically. We're going to cover those events now. This is going to be a breakdown of an ECG wave. There's also one in your lecture notes with all of this broken down as well. We'll start with the P wave at the very start of the ECG. The P wave is going to represent atrial depolarization. Atrial depolarization is simply, simply the electrical event in which the atria will have an electrical potential travel across them. Remember that electrical activity does not denote physical activity. So because the atria is depolarizing, don't confuse that and think that they have started contracting. Contraction follows the electrical activity. It's like when you flip on a light switch. When you flip on the light switch, there's a slight delay between you flipping the switch and the light turning on. The same thing is the case with the heart. There is a slight delay between the atria depolarizing and then the atria contracting. So remember that the ECG is electrical activity only. The next is going to be the QRS complex, very large, violent looking wave. This represents ventricular depolarization. The size of it reflects the total amount of depolarization and therefore the amount of conductive tissue that has been stimulated. Now, it is important to note that the atria also repolarize at this same time, but you don't see that wave because the QRS, uh, the ventricular depolarization, is so strong. So you won't see that separate wave, but do know that it occurs during this time period. Finally, there's the T wave here. The T wave is ventricular repolarization. Now, notice it's the same direction as depolarization. 
This is because when it repolarizes, it's going to actually repolarize in the opposite direction that it was depolarized. Let me remind you that ventricular depolarization goes from the tip of the heart apex up towards the base. Well, repolarization goes from the base towards the apex. So because of this, it's going to appear as though the wave is positive because it's going backwards, hence why it's reversed. There are some diseases that cause this wave to go in the opposite direction, like cardiac ischemia. This reverses the direction of the T wave. Now I'm gonna talk about a few of the other components. First is gonna be the PR interval. The PR interval is gonna be the total duration of the P wave. You can see it goes from the very start of the P wave all the way to the start of the QRS complex. This is going to represent the entire electrical activity of the atria as far as its depolarization. So it's measuring the length of the P wave. Next is the QT interval. Now the QT interval, not listed in your lecture notes, but still important here, the QT interval is gonna represent the entire duration of ventricular electrical activity. So it goes from the very start of the QRS complex to the very end of the T wave there. And it's just uh, the duration of all ventricular electrical activity, the depolarization and the repolarization. The last two pieces we need to cover are the segments. The PR segment is actually going to be the time between atrial and ventricular depolarization. So when atrial depolarization ends and when ventricular depolarization begins, there's a gap there. This is a delay. This is the PR segment, and it is a measure of the AV delay that we talked about in the previous lecture and previous slides. It is used to diagnose blockages in the conduction system of the heart. Finally, there is the ST segment. Seen here, the ST segment is the time between the S wave of the QRS complex, so ventricular depolarization finishing, and ventricular repolarization beginning, the start of the T wave. This occurs when the heart remains depolarized, so this allows the time for the ventricles to empty. It is usually never flat and has a slight trend upwards as repolarization is beginning. So these are gonna be all of the major segments of the ECG. Now we went through all of the electrical events of the heart and we went through the ECG so that we could combine them together. So that way you can actually see here the correlation between the electrocardiogram and the electrical events in the heart. And we'll start of course with depolarization of the atria. Here we can see the initiation of the P wave. It's going to start from depolarization beginning at the SA node as it travels across the atria, depolarizing it. From here, we finish the P wave, so the atria are depolarized and we've entered into the PR segment. The PR segment is where the ventricles are allowed to fill and the atria are contracting during this time period. From here, we move into the start of the QRS complex and the full ventricular depolarization. It will begin with the Q wave where it will travel down the bundle branches towards the Purkinje fibers. From there, we go R, S, and that's where we finish ventricular depolarization and we now move into the ST segment. The ST segment, remember, is going to represent where the ventricles are contracted and emptying during this time period as blood flows out the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Finally, we enter into the T wave where you can see repolarization is happening. Remember that depolarization occurs from apex towards base, repolarization occurs from base towards apex. So it's going to be relaxing in the opposite direction that it depolarized. And with that, we have now finished the electrical events of the cardiac cycle. Now that the T wave is done, the heart is repolarized and relaxed. So remember that a P, QRS, and T wave all together represents one total heartbeat, one total heart cycle. So every time you see a cluster of these, it's gonna represent one heartbeat, and we can typically count these out. We can also tell other things from an ECG. We can tell our overall heart rate by counting the total number. We can tell if it's occurring in a rapid amount um, to where it's tachycardic. This means over 100 beats per minute or if it's too slow, below 50 beats per minute, that'd be bradycardic. 
We can tell the rhythm of the heart, if it's fast, slow, or irregular based upon the waves. We can talk, uh, tell about conduction blocks. If there's like multiple P waves for every QRS, that means we have some sort of conduction block in the AV node or maybe even in the internodal pathways. And finally, we can talk about cardiac hypertrophy. In this case, we have we identify cardiac hypertrophy by an enlarged QRS and T wave due to more conductive tissue. Enlarged hearts can sometimes mean that the person has a heart that is not necessarily stronger, but having to work harder, typically due to obesity or uh, different metabolic diseases that cause cardiac hypertrophy in the negative sense. We're now gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the physics of circulation. So how does blood circulate through the body and what are the laws that govern it? This is of course called hemodynamics, how blood moves. Now, why does blood flow? It flows because liquids are going to flow down pressure gradients where there is a change in pressure, abbreviated delta P. A pressure gradient is where there is a high pressure and then a low pressure. The heart is going to create fluid pressure by squeezing or contracting around a volume of fluid, in this case blood, and the blood will flow out of the heart where the highest pressure is generated in that ventricle. And then it will flow into the closed circulatory system that has lower pressure. As blood circulates, it's going to gradually and continuously lose pressure as it travels down the gradient. The highest pressure vessel that we have in the body is the aorta, which is gonna be attached to the left ventricle. The lowest pressure vessel in the body is the vena cava, which is attached to the right atrium. Blood will flow from the aorta through the arteries into the arterioles, then into the capillaries where exchange happens, and then back towards the heart via the venules, veins, and vena cava, all the while gradually losing pressure. As I stated before, we're gonna be talking about the different laws of hemodynamics. Well, the first is that contraction of the heart, more specifically of the left ventricle, results in an increased pressure on the fluid inside. This is called an increase in hydrostatic pressure, or the pressure of fluid against the walls of its container. Here we can see hydrostatic pressure demonstrated. Fluid is going to be in all of these different cylinders with a cork at one end. So fluid is pushing up against the walls of its container. This is hydrostatic pressure, like water in a water bottle. Now, remember in this case, the fluid is not yet moving. It is water is water, hydro, static is unmoving. The units of fluid pressure are going to be in millimeters of mercury in this case, throughout our entire lecture. Millimeters of mercury is always gonna be used to measure pressure. The pressure developed specifically by the ventricle is often called the driving pressure because it will drive the flow of blood away from the heart. This is going to mean the same thing as hydrostatic pressure. Now, we've opened up the gateway and created that driving pressure. So we are now moving to law two. When the driving pressure, hydrostatic, in the ventricle rises above the hydrostatic pressure of the blood and the aorta, the valve will open and blood will flow out. As you can see here, that fluid is going to be flowing out now that I have a driving pressure. Now, why? Because blood is flowing from an area of high pressure to low fluid pressure. And we can see that here as the fluid flows out, it is going from the highest pressure at the very end all the way down to the lowest pressure. Remember that flow is going to be proportional to the change in pressure. So pressure one, the high pressure, and pressure two, the low pressure. Blood flow is going to be expressed as liters per minute or some sort of volume over time metric. As I stated in the previous slide, remember that pressure is created by contracting the muscles and it's transferred to the blood. This is the driving pressure that is created by the ventricles. If the blood vessels dilate, the blood pressure will decrease. Dilation means blood vessels open up more. If blood vessels constrict, that means blood pressure will increase. The vessel walls are going to get smaller. 
volume will change volume changes affect blood pressure in the cardiovascular system so if i have an increase in total volume of blood blood pressure will go up if i have a decrease in volume of blood blood pressure will go down so these are all going to be different variables that can affect overall pressure now like i said before fluid will flow through a tube depending upon the pressure gradient so the fluid through a tube is directly proportional to the pressure gradient so flow is and that little symbol is proportional to a change in pressure the higher the pressure gradient the greater the fluid flow so this is a simple diagram to illustrate the equation that we've already talked about fluid will flow only if there is a positive pressure gradient here we can see that there's a higher pressure towards a lower pressure so p1 minus p2 equals a change in pressure that is positive because it's going from higher to lower. This means you will have a flow rate in that given direction. However, if pressure is the same on both sides of the vessel, in this case, we have a 100, millimeter per, 100 millimeters of mercury and 100 millimeters of mercury, there's no difference between them. So if there's no pressure gradient, you can have no flow. So in this case, there's no change in pressure. So that means blood will not move through this vessel. So law three is that moving fluid is now exerting a hydraulic pressure as it flows. Remember there are two components of hydraulic pressure, kinetic energy of flow and hydrostatic pressure on the vessel walls. Again, hydraulic pressure is the pressure of a moving fluid. For blood flow to occur, the absolute pressure of the system doesn't matter as much as the change in pressure. So we can see that here. Flow is dependent upon the pressure gradient, not on the absolute pressure. It's about the change. So here we can see the first, the top vessel has a blood pressure starting at 100 millimeters of mercury and then a pressure of 75 millimeters of mercury. So in that case, it's a positive pressure difference. So it's going to actually be 25 millimeters of mercury. So we can see that that's the given flow rate. Let's go to the bottom vessel. Now, 40 and 15. That is a lower pressure system because 40 and 15 are smaller than 175, but the difference between them is still 25. So even though the top vessel has a higher overall pressure system, the difference or change in pressure is the same between the vessels. And for this reason, flow rate will be equal because the change in pressure is equal among vessels. Law four, resistance opposes flow. Remember that friction of blood against the vessel walls is gonna decrease the energy of the flow. The rate of fluid flow is inversely proportional to resistance. That's shown here by flow proportional to one over R. This means inversely proportional. So that means that as resistance increases, flow decreases. So if I shrink the size of it, resistance increases would be vasoconstriction or shrinking the size of my hose. If resistance decreases, vasodilation, flow will increase if I have a bigger hose. Here we can see an example of our given fluid container and then we have two vessel sizes, one with a radius of one and one with a radius of two. Radius of A, one, is going to produce a given volume. Notice how much, the, how much larger the volume of B is. This is again showing you that as the radius of the tube decreases, the resistance to flow increases. From the previous slide, we can see that small changes in the radius have a large effect on resistance to blood flow. Remember that vasoconstriction is a decrease in blood vessel size and thus decreases blood flow. It's shrinking the size of the system, but it is raising pressure. Vasodilation is an increase in blood vessel diameter and radius and therefore increases blood flow because it is decreasing the total resistance that is applied. So this shows you that flow is proportional to the change in pressure over resistance. So flow of blood in the cardiovascular system is now, according to this, now that we've added all these pieces, directly proportional to the pressure gradient and inversely proportional to the resistance to flow. And we have now reached the fifth and final law of hemodynamics.
the velocity of flow depends upon flow rate and vessel diameter. So remember that velocity is not flow rate, okay? Flow rate is the total amount of blood, the volume. That's gonna be flow. Velocity is how much distance a set volume moves in a given time period. So it's about the speed within which something is moving, not how much of that stuff is moving. Velocity, like I said, is dependent on flow rate and vessel diameter. As vessel size decreases, velocity increases. As vessel size increases, velocity decreases. Let me give you an example. You take a garden hose and, you're going, and you turn it on. You're gonna start watering some of the plants in front of you. And it's coming out at that given flow rate on whatever level that you turned it on. Suddenly you see some flowers further away, but the current flow rate that you have and the current velocity that it's moving, you can't get the water to actually travel to those flowers. It's only going to the plants in front of you. So what do you do in order to get it to the flowers that are further away? You put your thumb over the tip, over the actual opening of the hose, thus decreasing vessel size and increasing the velocity that that water is going to move so it will spray moving faster and further and far enough to be able to get to those flowers way over there. So that's how you can actually showcase the velocity of flow is simply that decreasing vessel diameter or decreasing the vessel size to increase the velocity. There's not more fluid flowing, it's simply moving faster. That's the key thing. Remember that smaller vessels have a higher velocity of flow. We're now switching gears a little bit again, and we've covered the electrical systems of the heart, how blood moves through the heart a bit. And we've now talked about some of the laws of hemodynamics and how blood flows through the body. We're now gonna talk about the different functional phases of the cardiac cycle and how the heart is organized and how it works together now that we've covered a lot of the electrical systems. The cardiac cycle is broken into two main phases, diastole and systole. Typically when referring to these, we're talking about the actions of the ventricles because these are gonna produce the greatest amount of movement of blood. But in general, diastole is a period of relaxation. This is where the chamber is going to be relaxed, either the atria or the ventricle. The chamber is relaxed, and so therefore blood is filling. In systole, this is the opposite. It is contraction. During this phase, the myocardium will contract and increase the hydrostatic pressure of the blood on the walls. Once chamber and the pressures rise above the pressure on the other side of the valve, in either the pulmonary artery or the aorta, blood will then flow out to those vessels. We'll be talking about these in major relation towards the ventricles, but we'll break it down in the atria as well. Here we can see the different events of the cardiac cycle laid out, and we'll isolate each one as we go through. I want you to take note of the circle in the center. The outer circle represents the action of the ventricles, whether they are in diastole, relaxation, or systole, contraction. On the inner circle, we're looking at the atria. The atria have a systole period, contraction, and diastole period, relaxation. Their diastole period is much longer for the atria than it is their contraction period. And this is due to the actions of the ventricles. Let's start going through the different events of the cardiac cycle. We'll begin in late diastole. This is late ventricular diastole. Here, both sets of atria and ventricles are relaxed the AV valves are open, so the tricuspid and bicuspid valves are open, and blood is flowing in to the atria and then into the ventricles. It is the ventricles are filling passively in this case because the atria are not contracting yet. From here, we then move into two atrial systole. Here, the SA node is going to fire, initiating atrial depolarization. Following this, the atria will contract and uh, primer pump the ventricles. That means by them contracting, they're forcing the small amount of blood that they still have left in them into the ventricles, and they're also 
forcing an increase of pressure from the atria into the ventricles. So this is going to increase the pressure of the ventricles as they finish filling with blood, finishing atrial systole. From atrial systole, we go into that earlier, the early ventricular systole phase where we have the isovolumic ventricular contraction. Isovolumic, this means there's no change in volume during this phase. Here, the ventricles will begin to contract, pressure will increase, but blood does not flow out yet. It won't flow out until the ventricular pressure is greater than that of the vessels. During this phase, isovolumic contraction, we also hear the first heart sound called LUP. The LUP sound is actually going to be the sound of the valves closing, the AV valves, the atrioventricular and the, the atrioventricular valves or your bicuspid and tricuspid valves. From there, pressure has now risen enough and we enter into ventricular systole, the ejection phase, ventricular ejection. Here, the pressure has risen so much that the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves are forced open and blood moves into the pulmonary arteries and aorta. The aortic pressure increases dramatically during this time period and the atria are repolarizing as they go through atrial diastole. They also begin filling during this time period too with uh, just passive blood coming in from the vena cava and the pul pulmonary veins. Then we enter into isovolumic ventricular relaxation. This is going to be the start of ventricular diastole. Here the ventricles will relax and you will hear the second heart sound, dup. So the heart sounds go lup, dup, lup, dup. Dup is the sound of the semilunar valves closing. So remember that the AV valves, bicuspid and tricuspid, close during phase three or isovolumic ventricular contraction, whereas the semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonary, are going to close during step five, isovolumic ventricular relaxation phase. Here, the ventricle pressure is also dropping. The volume remains constant as all valves are closed during this time period and pressure in the ventricle is still higher than pressure in the atria until the end of this phase, and then it goes back into the late diastole. We're actually going to finish the lecture here, but start lecture 13 with this diagram and then move into a diagram discussing the relationship between pressure and volume during the different phases of the cardiac cycle.